And speaking of trials, we have our legal analyst standing by right now. We're going to head over to Zach Merchant to give a little bit of color on what we're seeing here. Guys, you're right. Good evening. This is John Meixner with us now. You're currently a UGA law professor, but you spent years as a federal prosecutor before that. I want you to put your prosecutor hat back on. From a uh, prosecutor's perspective, what are the strongest elements of this case that District Attorney Fonnie Willis has brought? Yeah, thanks, Zach. Uh, you know, I think the RICO charge is very expansive in this case. It's a very complicated case. Uh, one strong aspect is the sort of factual background in this case is pretty well known. There's not a, a lot of serious unknowns in the indictments, and I think Fonnie Willis uh, for the most part, knows what those witnesses are going to say when they get to trial, and that makes the path for preparation a lot easier. Now, uh, lawyers are always taught to think of a case from all angles. I know you spent the majority of your career prosecuting cases, but if you shifted gears, and we're looking at this from a defense perspective, what do you think a defense attorney, what threads would they likely be pulling as we move forward into this case, presumably, at least for some defendants, eventually towards a trial? Yeah, I think uh, a few different things. One is the sort of procedural complexity that's involved in dealing with this kind of case. So if there are uh, severances, so if there are different trials for different defendants, that can become more complicated for the prosecutor. And then I think the real issue is uh, many of the charges uh, requires the prosecutor to demonstrate that Trump or other defendants knew that they were uh, making false statements when they were acting for some of those charges. And it's always difficult to prove the state of mind of individual people. Now, we are watching right now on the monitors here former President Trump's motorcade presumably making its way back to Hartsfield-Jackson Airport. This is the biggest flashpoint of the legal challenges the former president faces, and that flashpoint happening right here in Atlanta. But it's not the only case that the former president faces. He's got two federal cases, one out of Florida, one out of D.C., the D.C. case being an election interference case in its own right, and another state case in New York. You were a federal prosecutor. You're familiar with challenging cases. What kind of wrinkles are just logistically these multiple cases going to pose for all of the attorneys and all of the witnesses involved here, and for that matter, the defendants? Enormous challenges. I'll start with the prosecutors. Uh, anytime you have overlapping cases like these, there's a lot of overlap between the Georgia case and the federal January 6th case. Uh, anytime you have witnesses who are going to testify multiple times, that becomes uh, difficult. Obviously, prosecutors aren't going to know exactly when things are going to happen. They've got to be well prepared. Uh, I think in these cases, uh, you have a bunch of folks who are very well versed, who have been investigating these cases for a very long time, and they're ready to go. How do prosecutors, and for that matter, probably judges, too, decide which case actually goes first uh, on social media, which is always a, a thing we're wary of bringing too far into the conversation, but folks have talked about it almost feels like there's a line forming between these multiple cases and different district attorneys, different prosecutors are trying to find their position in this queue of who actually takes the former president to trial first and if there will be a trial before the 2024 presidential election? Yeah, all good questions that are, are hard to predict. I think the judges are probably pretty mindful of cases that are going on in other jurisdictions. Some things are outside of their control. So uh, Kenneth Cheesebro filed a, a motion asserting his speedy trial right here in Georgia. And I think when that sort of thing happens, that pushes a case usually to the front of the line because defendants have uh, specific rights uh, to go to trial, and those are usually respected as best as possible. Now, in this case, former President Trump's bond was set, it, what's known as a consent bond. It was agreed upon between the district attorney's office and his defense attorneys before he turned himself in today. That's, in one way, what helps him get in and out so quickly, among all the other security concerns and the unique status of the former president. But one of the conditions of his bond was that he is ordered not to talk to other defendants, not to talk to other witnesses, including in his bond uh, on social media. How do you anticipate, uh, how big of a challenge do you think that will be for the former president, and, and how do judges manage this sort of unique condition? Yeah, uh, usually law enforcement is uh, investigating, making sure that folks are following the conditions of their bond. There's sometimes court officers who do that 
as well. Uh, it's very important to protect the integrity of the uh, evidence, to protect victims and folks who might be uh, at threat. Uh, and obviously, any case involving uh, Donald Trump and social media, uh, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I think there will be unique challenges here. So if you're watching us right now, you're watching us likely on television, either online or, or over the air or over cable. We're seeing the pictures live right now of the former president's motorcade moving back towards the airport, Hartsfield Jackson. One of the unique components about criminal cases in the state of Georgia is that they frequently, almost always, are also on camera. Cameras are welcome in the court. What kind of dynamic, what kind of impact do you anticipate that will have as we move forward? I think it's extremely important. Some of us are old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson trial and uh, how that took the public uh, sort of by storm. I think we're going to have uh, that magnified even greater in the event of a trial. In this case, I think it's gone into uh, Fannie Willis's decision making. Part of the strength of a RICO charge is it allows for a lot of latitude to tell a broad story, bring in a lot of evidence about the enterprise that was going on. And I think she's thinking about how the public is going to be watching uh, these trials and uh, taking in all the things that happened during that period of months. You mentioned uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis's seeming decision to charge a large group of defendants, 19 in all, and you referred to it as telling a broad story to the jury. Others have commented that perhaps this is a misfire, uh, a strategic mistake in that the district attorney would have been better off taking this in pieces and charging smaller groups at a time. Talk to me about the pros and cons of each approach. Yeah, so the con is, I think what we're already seeing is that it's procedurally very complex. Some defendants may assert a right to go to trial early on. Others, I wouldn't be surprised if the president uh, files motions and is trying to delay things. So that presents problems if uh, Ms. Willis had to try the case for some defendants at one time and then do another trial for other defendants. That makes everything uh, more complex. It's the opposite of the approach taken uh, by Jack Smith in the federal cases just charging uh, President Trump trying to make things in a neat and tidy box. The pros are it allows her to bring in all of the evidence about uh, everything that happened developing the, the fake electors scheme and all of the things that are contained in the indictment. And so it allows her in some ways uh, to bring in a sort of broader, more comprehensive perspective of all of the things that are charged as crimes here. Is part of the theory behind that that if you're presenting a, a complex case to jurors, you want to give them, in some ways it's human nature, to want to see the full story as alleged. Is that part of the strategic choice here? That presenting almost the, again we should say the prosecutor's version, because defense attorneys certainly are going to do everything they can to rebut the accusations, but prosecutors, in this case with this broad indictment, are able to, to bring a, a full narrative. I think that's exactly right. I think any prosecutor or defense attorney will tell you that trying a case is about telling a story. Uh, lawyers are storytellers, lawyers are folks who try to simplify complex things and break them down into easy to understand concepts for jurors. I think uh, part of the benefit of the RICO statute is it allows Fannie Willis to try to tell that entire story to the jury. You spent time again uh, as a federal prosecutor. We're seeing right now the liaison between local law enforcement and federal law enforcement, uh, the Federal Secret Service at the very least today vitally involved in the journey of former President Trump to uh, the jail and back today. Talk to us briefly about how that relationship typically works between federal law enforcement and state and local law enforcement. Yeah, there's normally substantial cooperation. I worked on many cases involving task forces that were combined, uh, made up of FBI agents and local police officers. So they're pretty well versed in working together both on investigations and on more sort of security or safety oriented things like what we're seeing today. One of the components about uh, the Georgia case, this Fulton County case, and uh, we are actually going to take it back to the desk right now.